Okay, so welcome to this week's Origins Colloquium. Where it's a pleasure to have Melise Fonfon giving the talk this week. Melise, of course, is uh, Origins postdoc at the University of Virginia, but visiting Chalmers uh, in these weeks. And uh, so Melise received, uh, well, she did her master's degree in uh, Grenoble, University of Joseph Grenoble in 2015, and then completed her PhD degree in astrochemistry at the Max Planck Institute Radio Astronomy in Bonn, working with Arno Galosh and Professor Carl Menton. And uh, then she was a postdoc at, uh, uh, in Bordeaux, uh, working with uh, Sylvain Morton and Dumas Singeri. And I guess it was in 22 you came yep. to uh, Charlottesville as an Origins Fellow. And uh, great with them and working in the Growers Group and our group. And so, yes, we look forward to your talk uh, today. Okay, that's not the right screen. Let me wait to share the right presentation. Um, I can show up on the screen. That should be okay. I speak, I'm sure to speak loudly and put my yeah. yeah sure. I'm gonna try my best because as you can hear from my voice, I unfortunately got sick over the weekend. So I'm gonna I hope my voice will survive until the end of the presentation. Well, if my presentation shows up. <laughs> Fine. There we go. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Looks like it's working. So, well, thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. I was not expecting you to do the full introduction, and that makes me feel a bit old, but that's coming. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so I'm here today to talk about, well, I should say that I'm working on several projects at the, at the moment, but all of these projects are kind of like related to the same thing. And so this is what I want to talk about today. The idea is to break down the chemical complexity that is observed towards high mass star forming regions. And what I'm going to talk about today is the way I do it by using a com by using a combined observational and chemical modeling analysis. So I would like to start with uh, give like giving you a bit of context, telling you about the emergence of chemical complexity in star forming regions. And for this, I really want to start with the basics here, starting with defining what are complex organic molecules or COMPs. So these are these carbon-bearing molecules that are composed of six or more atoms that, as astrochemists, we consider as being already complex molecules when we see them in space. So these molecules, just to give you an idea, they represent about one-third of the more than 300 species that have been detected in the interstellar and circumstellar medium so far. And I'm showing you a few examples here. So on top, you have methanol, which is usually uh, taken as an example of the simplest of the complex organic molecules and also the one that is the most uh, widespread in the interstellar medium. But of course, among these comps, we have more complex species, ones that are associated with sugars like glycolaldehyde. We have some carbon chains and also some uh, precursors of amino acids. Uh, the reason why these complex molecules have attracted a lot of interest over the last decades is that they are often seen as the starting points of the prebiotic chemistry, kind of like seen as uh, bulbing blocks of life. And even more interesting is that some common trends are seen in the molecular composition of young protostellar objects and comets, which suggests that there exists some kind of chemical link between the earlier stages of the star formation process and later on the formation and evolution of planets. So originally, these complex organic molecules, they were detected uh, for the first time towards high mass star forming regions, and in particular, at a very specific uh, stage of this high mass star forming sequence here. Yes, I'm just going to try to use yeah, my cursor here to show things. So at this particular stage that we call the hot core stage. So in the literature, you may find the slightly different definition of hot cores. So I just wanted to highlight the one I'm going to use today in my presentation. By hot core, I mean a hot and dense envelope of gas that is rich in cons that is surrounding a young, newly formed protostellar object, a massive one. Um, the kind of like commonly adopted scenario for the formation of these complex organic molecules is that they actually form at much earlier time and lower temperatures already during this crystalline phase, where this, uh, where the atoms and molecules that are in the gas phase are accreted on the surface of the screens, they, they, they will build an ice mantle around the grains in which chemical reactions will happen to build more complex species. 
And later on during the process, when the temperature goes above 100 Kelvin, most of these molecules will be released into the gas phase via thermal desorption here. But this is not the only mechanism to produce these molecules. There are also non-thermal desorption mechanisms, and they can also uh, be produced directly in the gas phase. And so for this reason, more recently, more complex, well, complex species have also been detected at different stages of the star formation process at later times after the hot core stage, but also at much earlier time already during this pre-stellar phase. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much in my presentation, but I think it's worth to mention it as well, that this complex species are also detected at the different stages of the low mass star formation process, in particular in this uh, stage that is the low mass counterpart of the hot core that we often, that is often referred to as the hot corino stage. And so the fact that these complex species are detected in so many different objects that obviously have also different physical properties uh, brings some fundamental questions. Like for instance, is the production of this complex species local in nature, which means that it depends on the physical conditions of the objects? Or can we imagine also a scenario in which, oops, sorry, in which all these molecules are formed at the earlier stage and then the chemical composition of each of these objects is actually just basically inherited from the, the earlier uh, stage here. So we are still, this, this topic is still strongly debated and there are a lot of still open questions that, I'm try, that I try to summarize in the three um, points here. So the first one would be how, when, and where exactly uh, do these complex organic molecules form during the star formation process? The second one would be, is there a link between chemical composition and physical properties? And the underlying question here would be, if we take a, a sample of sources with similar physical conditions, do we assume that they, well, can we expect that they all have the same chemical composition or is there a real chemical diversity among these sources? And the last one would be because I showed you just before this evolutionary sequence with the hot core and the hot corino stage, Actually, do all star forming objects go through the same evolutionary sequence with the hot core or hot corino stage? Or can we also imagine some objects that will never go through the stage and never show this gas rich in cause? So the way I like to address these big open questions is first by doing the analysis of observational data. And in my case, I'm working mostly on millimeter to millimeter data uh, taken with the ALMA interferometer that you see here. But I'm also working with numerical simulations with models because these models were used to interpret the observations, especially now that we get a huge amount of data from this kind of telescopes. We need to, to use the models to help us to interpret this huge amount of data. But the other way around, the observations allows us to set constraints on our models and to improve our models. So I like to see this in kind of like an iterative process working in the loop where the more observations you have, the better are going to be the constraints on your models. And the better your models are constrained, the better your interpretation of the observations will be. And so, being quite slow, yeah. And so I want to start with talking about the observational side here. So there are many different uh, observing programs that exist that target hot cores and are intended to derive a chemical composition. I'm just gonna focus on one today, the last one on which uh, I've been working. So this project is called ALMA-MF, and so it's a lot program that was uh, conducted with the ALMA interferometer that targets 15 high mass star forming regions that you see here represented with purple stars spread over the, the galactic plane. And so um, the work I've done in this project, as you can see, this paper I published was called ALMA MF uh, 11. So just to tell you that this project was and is still very productive. And many people have been working on the origin of the IMF that stands for the initial mass function for this project, but that's not at all what I've been doing. I've been focusing on the chemical content of the sources that are detected in this high mass star forming regions, and in particular, using the emission of complex molecules to build the catalog of potential hot core candidates. And I've been using in particular the emission that we have in this one specific narrow spectral window, where we have one complex molecule that is CH3 or CHO, methyl formate, where you see that we have four lines that are like strong lines, well detected, and I'm going to use these lines. Well, I used these lines for my analysis. One advantage is that we have a low uh, level of contamination by other species in the spectral window, so these lines can easily be uh, identified in an automated way. And so the idea is to. So 
sorry, just I'm passing my slides, but nothing. Oh, yeah, okay. See, it's happening here, but not on my laptop. That's why I'm getting confused. Okay, sorry. So the idea is that we're going to use the same uh, velocity window here and integrate the emission in this velocity window to study the, the spatial distribution of this molecule in an automated way towards this 15 regions. And so this is what you see on this slide. Basically, these are the moment zero maps of metaformate towards the 15 target regions. And I want to go into just some more details for some of these regions. Here you have an example where you have um, individual sources that you can distinguish pretty well even by eye. These are circular cores that are like a compact emission, just a few thousand AU, and they can be kind of like in clustered regions. But we have different types of morphologies. All, not all the regions are like that. We have regions that are slightly different in the sense of like the emission from metaformate is more extended and it's more difficult to make the difference by eye, like where are the different sources in this region. And finally, the last type of sources we could identify are the regions where we have isolated objects. And in this particular case, a very faint source in the whole field of view here. And this is pretty surprising because when we look at the continuum emission measured at 1.3 millimeter towards this region, we see that we have as many as 57 dust continuum cores with masses up to 10 solar masses. And it looks like only one of these 57 cores actually show, shows emission from complex species. So this is already some indications that there are clear, significant, uh, clear uh, significant differences in the chemical composition of all these cores within one region, but also in between the different regions that are investigated in this RMIMF project. And so that also brings the question, does metaformate trace a single type of objects because of all these different uh, structures that we saw here? So to try to answer these questions, I've been investigating in more details the, and characterizing and investigating in more details the properties of these cores. And what I'm showing here is the mass of the 76, yeah, I think it's 76 in total metaformate sources we extracted from the RMIMF data as function of the size of the emission. So that's like the extent of the emission in the mass. And what we see is that we have about 30% of our sources that have masses about eight, above eight solar masses. And these are the ones I will qualify as hot cores here. And just as a reminder, again, what I call a hot core is a single massive object that is internally heated, such that it, uh, it leads to the thermal desorption of complex species in the gas phase. For the rest of the sources, they have lower masses. And so what, what are they exactly? Could they just be like the lower mass counterpart of hot cores, like hot corinos? Well, actually, if we're looking at the size, they have an extent of about 1,000 up to 4,000 AU, which if we compare to what is known in the literature for hot corinos is much larger than what is known. For hot corinos, we are more expecting sizes of the order of like a hundred or few hundred AU. So we explored other options and like that could be based on more intermediate mass objects, or it could also be that metaformate is present and we, in the gas phase and we detected it, but it's not because of the thermal heating from a hot core, but it has a different origin that could be accretion shocks or outflows. So these are two, yeah, these are two options we explored while digging a bit more into the data. So what you see here is one of the alma IMF region, G328.25, for which the two uh, red crosses that you see are the peaks of metaformate emission that were identified in this, in this map. And you see that these peaks are shifted compared to the position of the peak of the continuum emission that is expected to be the position of the central polar star. And these two peaks were actually interpreted as the positions of accretion shocks and so um, when I'm talking about accretion shocks, it's when you have the gas that is unfolding from the envelope into the accretion disk with such different velocities that it will produce shocks at the interface between the disk and the rest of the envelope. And this was confirmed by looking into other uh, observational data at high angular resolution, which is where you see that other oxygen bearing species like methanol and ethanol also have these two peaks that are shifted compared to the position of the protostar. Here's another uh, of the RMIMF target in which you can see again, so the red crosses show you the position of the peak of the metaformate emission. And while this one in the middle is expected to be the main hot core that triggers a powerful uh, outflow here, this, you can see that these two metaformate sources are not associated with the dust continuum core that are represented here with the green ellipses. And so that calls into question the nature of these sources. If they're not associated with those continuum cores, most likely they're not individual protostars, not hot cores. And so as they are in the direction 
uh, of this blue shifted log of the outflow here, it could be that just the meso, the metaformate, sorry, is present in the gas just because of this hot flow happening. This is actually a side project that I have at the moment where I'm digging into observations at high angular resolution to try to understand what is going on here. Because based on simply the observations, we cannot go further here without having high angular resolution data. We cannot really answer this question on the origin of metal formates. So that brings me to the second part of my presentation, where to be able to address and answer this kind of questions, we need to uh, use the numerical models. And when I'm talking about these models, I'm mainly talking, of course, about astrochemical models. And these are the kind of figures we are uh, usually used to. So this figure shows you the, the prediction of the models. So this is the, the, the evolution of the fractional abundances of a set of species. And you see that I selected some complex species here. And it shows you the evolution as a function of time and as a function of the temperature in the envelope. And so basically, what you can see on this plot is that uh, here it shows you that at early time and low temperature, if you look at the dotted line, you see that the abundance of each species is increasing. This is the formation on the surface of the, of the ice, on the grains. And then later on, and at higher temperature, these dotted lines will drop while the solid ones are increasing. The solid ones show you now the gas phase abundance. And this is basically the stage at which in the model we have the sorption of these molecules from the grains and back into the gas phase. In addition, in this kind of models, we can also dig into the results of the models to be able to identify what is the main mechanism that is responsible for the formation of one molecule. And I picked a very simple example here on which everyone now agrees that this is the main formation route for this molecule, so methanol, that is formed mostly on the surface of brains via the successive hydrogenation of CO that is accreted from the gas phase. So these are the kind of uh, figures and the kind of models we're used to. But in terms of the, the models for high mass star formation, um, very often in the past, we were limited to zero or 1D models. And for instance, this is the result of a 1D model here. And to models that use a non very accurate treatment of the, the, um, the evolution of the physical conditions in the protostellar envelope. And so this is why the work I'm doing now is actually taking uh, the chemical models, but combining them with 3D hydrodynamical simulations. And that's work that is very similar to what is done also in, in Johnson's group. And so what we want to do here is to go even one step further and put the results of this combined model into relative transfer code to produce synthetic observational data. What is pretty cool here is that that will help us in this loop of like using the models to interpret the observations and using the observation to better constrain the model because we can compare directly the synthetic observations with the real observational data. And also because we know exactly the input we have in both in our physical models and our chemical models that helps us to, to set uh, constraints on the observations. There is one last step to this uh, analysis here. That is the population diagram analysis to predict the temperature and the column density distributions, which are two parameters that we usually extract from the observational data, but I will come back to this towards the end of my presentation. I first want to go through each uh, step a bit in a bit more details just to explain you better the concepts. And I want to start with the physical model I'm using here. So I'm showing you first the, the envelope we're using. So it's a 2D hydrodynamical model. You have the protostar in the middle. And basically, the protostellar envelope is just split into small cells. And we are going up to like a radius of 20,000 AU. It's a 2D polar uh, grid. And we assume axial symmetry so that in this way, we can reconstruct the full 2D protostellar envelope. We feed in this envelope the time-dependent temperature and density, which are calculated solving the RHD equations using a modified version of a code that is called Asina plus plus. And we are using uh, pre-calculated stellar models to um, determine the evolution of the luminosity of the central pure star uh, over time. So instead of showing you boring equations, I'm just going to play a short video to give you an idea of how the physical properties evolve. So on the top panel, you will see the evolution of the density. And on the bottom panel, it's the evolution of the temperature. You have the small scale here. So you have the protostar in the middle. And you see the envelope up to 100 AU. And here, it's on a larger scale and a much larger scale. So. Just playing the video now, as you see, as a function of time, well, when the time is evolving here, all the material is, in, is in falling towards the sun protostar. And you see that uh, this the density is increasing a lot in this region here. So we are seeing the system edge on here. And this is basically the accretion disk that is forming. This disk 
uh, from which like all the material will be accreted to the protostar. And after the end of the simulation, which is about um, after 25,000 years here, we have formed a central star that has a mass of about 23 solar masses. <laughs> so if I just take a snapshot into the video I just showed you here, uh, all the black plots that you saw moving are actually the trajectories of tracers that we selected to run the chemical models in post-processing to be able to reconstruct the full 2D image. And in this case, we need about 2,000 trajectories, which means also running 2,000 chemical models. Um, one question question we had at this stage was how does the disk impact the detection of cones? Because we do have observational evidences that the formation of such disk in the high mass star forming regions can hinder the detection of cones either because the disk is too cold and so the molecules will stay frozen into the dust screens and will not appear in the gas phase or because of dust opacity effects. So keep, just keep this in mind. I will come back to this later in the presentation. First, I want to say a few words about the chemical model that I'm using. So in this case, uh, I'm using the chemical model that is called Magical, that has been developed by Rob Garrett at UVA. Uh, I won't go into all the details of the model. I just want to highlight a few numbers here. So first of all, this is a three-phase model, which means that we are calculating the chemistry that is taking place in the gas phase and also on the surface of the grains in two different phases. So we have the surface, which is basically the first layer of ice, and the rest of the bulk ice mantle. And I, for the chemical network, and I'm pretty sure these numbers are up to date now, so I will just say there are more than 800 distinct gas phase species involved in more than 40,000 chemical reactions and processes. And keep in mind that you kind of like have to multiply these numbers by three to consider also the, the surface species and processes and the mantle species and processes that are happening in the mantle as well. So again, instead of giving you more numbers, I just play a video that shows you uh, the evidences that are calculated by the model as a function of time, you see the time going here. And this is for four different molecules that you see indicated in the middle here. And on the top, you see the large scale evolution and the small scale evolution. Again, we are looking at the system edge on with the protostar in the middle. And what you see is that, for instance, if you look at Masano on the left here, you see that Masano falls pretty much uh, the, the shape of the accretion disk here. And we end up with an image that is that looks very similar to what we saw in, the, in the, the short video for the evolution of the density, but it's less obvious for other species, in particular for, for the cyanides, we do see the shape of the disk, but it's more like towards the end of this simulation. So this already indicates just looking at four different species that we do have significant differences uh, between different species. And now the idea is that we want to see how this uh, predictions from the model would look like if it was real observations, if this was really happening in the sky. And so this is why we go for the radioactive transfer modeling part. So for this, I use a code that is called radmc 3 Basically, I need to provide to this code as an input the chemical evidence maps that I showed just before that are calculated by the chemical model and the physical profile, so the distribution of density and temperature in the protostellar envelope. And I also need to provide some dust uh, opacity information molecular line parameters, and at the moment I'm working on the DLT assumption for the test I'm doing. So this will allow me to create uh, synthetic observations that come in the format of 3D data cubes, which means that I can extract from these cubes both synthetic maps and synthetic spectra. And I'm showing you an example here of what I get for metal format for one of our models. I'm saying one of our models because we actually have different physical models. I showed you the example of the one that has a mass with uh, that has a star with a final mass of 23 solar masses. This is our most extreme model at the moment, but we do have some more intermediate mass models and actually going down to the more Carino type of model. And this is important because what we notice is that obviously the accretion disk is getting smaller, but also colder. And so this will have an impact on our ability to detect complex species here. We also can run cubes here. I showed an example where I include only one molecule, but we can run cubes for different molecules or even include more molecules into one cube to really compare with real observational data. And we can run these cubes at different time steps into the simulation so that when we compare with the observations, we can also constrain the evolutionary stage of uh, the source we are looking at. Finally, the last parameter we can play with is the inclination angle. So again, as I said since the beginning, we are looking at the system edge on. So the protostar is somewhere here in the middle and we have the disk around it. But I can also rotate the whole system to get something that is more like 45 degrees or even more to have it with a viewing angle of zero degrees. So you're looking at the system full on with the protostar in the middle and the disk around it. 
And now on the left, I have a, the video playing that shows you at the same time for the same molecule and the same model, just how the, the, the map of the emission of this molecule evolves when we are changing the viewing angle of the system. And so this is a lot of cubes that we are producing at the moment, but luckily I'm not working on this alone. So just to mention that we have two PhD students, Real Sharp and Grace Ninjas, working at UVA, both working on different uh, models and helping me to dig into the, the data. So in terms of how we interpret this synthetic data, if I just take a snapshot into the video that was playing just before, what you see on the top one here, actually this kind of like analog that you see here is not the disk. It turns out that all the, the, the accretion disk is contained into the darker region in the middle. And it looks like the emission of complex species is completely blocked by the disk, at least at one millimeter. And that the emission that you see around it is kind of like a bubble of gas, kind of like the disk atmosphere that is around it. And so, as I mentioned, oops, sorry, as I mentioned before, we need to select a dust opacity profile to do this uh, synthetic observations. And here is just to show that I have used different opacity profiles using one that is like up to two order of magnitudes lower in terms of opacities at one millimeter than the other ones that are usually used. And it still looks like all the emission is blocked here. So the next step and the test we are doing at the moment is to go at longer wavelength, so lower frequencies where the dust is supposed to be less optically free to see if we can kind of like recover the emission that is coming from inside the disk. So now in terms of doing the direct comparison with the observations, here I pulled out just one of the maps I showed before in, in the case of the AlmaMF project. And I picked this one in particular because this is a region where the emission is really bright and we do have observations at high angular resolution that shows that this source is not more fragmented. So it's sort of like, it looks like it's a single protostar and it looks, the emission looks kind of circular, but if you look at the inner contour, actually, it's not completely symmetric, and we cannot explain it at the moment uh, just based on the observations. And so what we hope is that by comparing this kind of images with our synthetic images, we will be able to explain what's going on. We're not there yet, but that's what we hope to achieve at some point. Then we can also compare, of course, the spectra. So these are synthetic spectra taken towards different positions in the maps. And we can compare this with the real observation of data. Again, that's a spectrum taken from ALMA-MF. And what you see is that we're able to reproduce the four strong lines of metaformate and also one of the secondary fainter lines here. But of course, in the real observational uh, spectrum in blue, we have also other species that are not included yet in our cube. So that's why we're not able to reproduce the exact spectrum. But it still looks promising so far. So now that brings me to the very last part of this uh, analysis is that we can use the population diagram analysis to uh, predict the temperature and the color density, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, are both uh, values that we usually extract from the observations. And so for the people who are not familiar with the population diagram analysis, basically the idea is that you will take the integrated intensity of each of the line you have here, and you will plot that, and uh, you will plot it as function of the upper energy level of each of the transition. And basically, with this equation here, it gives you an indication on the rotational temperature and the colon density for each molecule. Of course, if I change this is for one position, so one pixel in the maps you see on the left. And of course, if I change position, the population diagram will look different, and I will extract a different temperature and colon density. And the idea is that we do that in an automated way for each pixel in the field of view. And we get a kind of a map of the temperature that looks like this. Of course, when we don't have enough data points, we're not able to constrain the temperature and the current density, so that will end up as like a white dot in this figure. But that still gives us an estimate of the temperature distribution in the inner part of the source. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I'm not sure I was speaking too fast. Or... OK, so coming to the end, and since this is still pretty much work in progress, I'm not going to show you like the usual conclusion with all the points. I just want to leave you with this. That is kind of like an overview of this tool I've been developing because, yeah, I forgot to mention that this, the idea is to have a tool that works in a completely automated way. You provide the input things and then all the rest will be calculated in an automated way without you having to do anything. With this first step, you will get uh, synthetic observations that you can compare directly with the observation, like what I showed before. And with the second step, you get the temperature and color density that you can compare in a more quantitative way. Uh, with what you derive from the observations. Now the question is, can we use this tool with other physical chemical models? And the answer is yes. This is what we have started to work on with Presenta, but it's still pretty much at the testing stage. So Presenta provided me a grid that is, as you can see, slightly different from the grid I showed you before. 
uh, here there is the, if I'm right, this is the outflow cavity that is not modeled here. And this is also a non-regular grid, which has been causing a bit of troubles. And I'm going to show you what we don't want to get. I plotted this just before coming, and it's supposed to be the density distribution. And by looking at it, I can already guess that there is something going wrong. But I thought, OK, I'm still going to show it to you, because that's exactly the only difficulty in using this tool, is to get the input data in the right format. And here it looks like I'm getting something wrong in the format. But it's fine. We're going to correct that. And once you have everything in the right format, as I said, everything is automated afterwards. Here, I just wanted to highlight that the maximum density in this plot is about uh, 10 to the 9th here, which is much smaller than the densities that uh, we were facing in the plots I showed before, in the sense that here we don't have the accretion disk, which was this very high density region. So just to mention that in this case, we will most likely not be facing the issue of the disk blocking all the emission of comms. So I guess this will be a must uh, um, a much simpler example. Uh, we had a discussion just before with Presenta and, and Johnson, so we agreed on like the opacity profiles we should use. We want to make some first tests uh, working in the CO lines. And for the line radiative transfer, we're going to make tests with um, the LT assumption, but also non-LT. And hopefully, results are going to come soon. So yeah, that's all for me today. Thank you for your attention. We have plenty of time for questions and discussions, so raise your hand in Zoom or here uh, in your conference room is under construction, so I think there's nobody there <laughs> now. I have a question. Hang on. Uh, yes, please go ahead. So if, um, if we're taking spectra from different places, right, doesn't the presence of different organics or different comps, as you say, shift the spectra at least a little bit? Like, how do you know? Like for instance, the the spectra comparison that you have for metal formate, um, yeah, that one, like it it fits very perfectly, but I'm having trouble imagining in the real life scenario where we're actually getting observations from other places as well, and there's other organics that are present in the mixture, which you also said like different parts of the cloud have different concentrations and different chemicals. But this is. Well, if I understand correctly what you're saying, this is all taken into account in the models because we have oh. the distribution of the densities, which means that for each pixel here, we have a value of the density, of the temperature, and also of the velocity field. Because if you assume that your cloud is in falling, then you have some rotation, and this is also taken into account. So if I understand correctly your question, this is all taken into account when creating the synthetic spectrum. And then it's the- It's an average over some, the whole core is all synthetic. Uh, no, this is really taken at one position. I, I'm actually showing, yeah, different ones. And basically the one, the purple one will be, I don't have the exact position, but kind of like in the brightest position. And then the two others where the lines are fainter towards the position that is more offset. So I wanted to compare really like pixel by pixel in this case. But one can also do it with like extracted from a beam. Does that answer your question? Somewhat, it, <laughs> it partially makes sense. Because I'm thinking, so if uh, let's let's say we're taking a new observation, mm -hmm. like a new region, and it has some other chemicals in it, how would we be able to distinguish whether that causes any sort of changes in the spectra that we take for metal formate? Oh well, the here the well, if I understand correctly, you know your question is how we deal with the fact that there are many molecules and not just this one. Like, yeah, how do we just distinguish that? Yeah, we'll find it in this range or exactly at this point in the spectra, like at this frequency. Like, how do we know exactly that the other organics are not influencing it, that it shifts the spectra? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by shifting the no, spectra. The gas phase here. Yeah. Not, uh, so the interaction with any other molecule is not going to factor in into how the spectra data gets collected. Okay, <laughs> I have a, a couple questions and one quick okay. question. So one is, so you have the temperature uh, Predictions for your synthetic data. Yeah. Have you compared it into the, what the temperature from the simulation is to see, like, do they actually correspond to each other, or you know, is the temperature you're getting from the synthetic data completely different than what the hydrodynamic system data is? Uh, or, or you mean the the temperatures I derived like here? Yeah, exactly. Have you basically compared this to what your what the simulation I says it should be? Yeah. 
I haven't compared it like exactly one to one because I'm still working on like getting this maps mm -hmm. exactly right. But uh, let's say that if I just looking at kind of like the order of magnitude here, you see the temperatures are going from, well, it's difficult to say because kind of like I'm expecting that all this is kind of like more noisy region, mm -hmm. but otherwise it's going from like, I would say 150 to up to 500 Kelvin. Okay. And it kind, of, it kind of makes sense. Okay. Compared to what I'm expecting, but I haven't done the exact comparison, okay. so that's something I'm gonna do. That's on the, yeah. the next step. Okay. No, it might be interesting. So far, yeah. yeah. So far, it kind of makes sense. So I'm happy with it. Okay. Now let's see. Okay. And the second question was, when you have the tracer particles, mm -hmm. um, how do you actually go through and and, and do the advantage? You know, when when you're following the the uh, tra trajectories. Uh, when I was in Cologne, there was a student who did this, but you know, this was for a large cloud, so slightly different, you know, velocities. So maybe for core clouds, it's simpler. But there's always a problem where if you have densities that are jump that go up very high, or basically any sort of variables that jump a lot, your chemistry can end up having artifacts where, like in, in that case, you were no longer conserving uh, uh, your uh, like total amount of carbon because there was, you know, just going from grid point to grid point. Um, maybe in this case it's not so bad because the core collapse is a bit smoother yeah. than a big cloud with turbulence and everything. But... I haven't been facing so far such an issue like that with like, as you said, the, the density really jumping. Okay. So I don't think this is an issue, but that's actually, yeah, that's, okay. you're right, that's something we should well, keep in mind. The trace particle, let me follow up on that, the, the trace mm -hmm. particle going for a grid cell, it must, there must be discrete uh, changes in uh, properties now as it leaves one cell to the next. So do you have... Are you smoothing those out or? Oh, uh, yes. Right. Yes. So maybe that just accounts yeah, for that. Yeah. So then have you just checked to like total atom conservation along a, 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 a trajectory? I guess it is done within the chemical model. It can, um, but you're changing the density too, right? So sometimes then just numerically you get drift. Uh, so in, in hydrocode, if you actually include the chemistry in hydrocode, you do like a multi species infection mm -hmm. such that you're conserving this because if you yeah. don't do it, you you know, you also get drift in hydro code, um, but for a large chemical network, normally it's not a problem because you do like a single temperature or a fixed density that you're not varying the, uh, it, it over time, but it might be a small thing, but it might just be worth, you know, just looking at the total I, amount of carbon, for instance. That, that's a very good point. That's not something I have personally checked. Yeah. I'm just hoping right now that this yeah. is something that's wrong. I've changed yeah. more, you know? I mean, if it drips, it probably gets by a small amount, yeah. and it's always worth it. But I, I'm check. suspecting and I'm hoping that this is yeah. working fine. Okay. <laughs> well, these are tracer, these are streamlined. These are tracer particles, yeah. they have fine streamlines. Yeah. So in some sense, uh, you know, abection is, is account for well, it's not really accounted for. The infection will be accounted for only in hydro steps, which is not something done here. So yeah, because presumably you're storing the abundances, but not yeah. the, the density, right? And so if you have a, an, an abundance, for instance, of, of all the molecules, and then you multiply it by a different density, of course, you're hopping, you know, your, your chemistry is actually probably changing smoothly there, but, you know, something else might happen that eventually, sometimes you just get interpolation errors, right? As you're kind of going between these that you end up uh, kind of drifting slowly. <laughs> Yeah, well, if it's not something I can see directly in the images, then that's definitely something we should keep an, an eye on. But I'm, I'm just, as I said again, I'm just expecting yeah, that this is going right that's and that true. there are some checks that make sure that everything is going right in the chemical model. I'm not calling myself in the into the yeah. both neither like the chemical or the physical model. But you I'm just can making do a check sure. though, because you, you you then paint these uh, yeah tracer screens back onto the make your images, and so you can just. You're tracking all the species, you know, so you could track, and, you know, where all the carbon is and everything. You could uh, add it all up. So, so when you regrid it, how do you do? You just do a nearest neighbor regrid it, yeah. or okay. Yeah. Uh huh. I have, I have a follow up question to Brant's first question, though, if I may. Uh, this temperature gradient of the species. Uh, when Presenta uh, and others in Soma looked at twenty eight point two, we these hot cores are not, we don't think are self luminous, but they're reflective of um, uh, temperature. Uh, yeah. so, so do, you, do you have such structures in your maps here that you'll see some high excitation, you know, <laughs> high upper state energy, and maybe high critical density is really concentrated, and you, and you see lower density, lower excitation species? Uh, and the Santa can remind me which yeah, species. Yeah, exactly. you Diameter liter and we have all the, I mean, not for the same molecule, we have for the excitation, but uh, we have diameter liter, which is with our uh, with the mission. 
So really, like when it's a 400 absorption energy, then which, uh, the emission, if you look at that particular species, is close to the photostar. But if you look like 100 Kelvin absorption energy, maybe they are more extended. So if you remember the figure uh, one in our paper, so when mm -hmm. we have the temperature, we have yes, the temperature yes. evidence of that one. So I wanted to have a look yeah. at this exact same species. Yeah, now what do you have like uh, mm -hmm. disengage uh, the different upstream yeah. nature of the component and if you see the emission, if there is any gradient, the high excitation close to the core and low excitation maybe then above. Yeah, yeah, I mean to compare more maps to be able to answer this question, mm -hmm. but that's something interesting to check here. Mm -hmm. But then you have holes because of the opacity as well yeah that, that's the other thing that i mentioned during the, the last group meeting that i'm also like dealing with how to correct for the lines that are affected by uh opacity here yeah uh, i have also a follow -up question on that so as you mentioned uh, from the very central part is uh, the emission is blocked right because of uh, opacity issue so what is the size of that uh, this particularly is uh, looking at images uh, three holes in the AU or something in diameter and the, the yeah part, well, it's like uh, here, I think, because I plotted it with a linear scale, it looks like it's all dark, but it's not exactly at zero. If I plot it with a more log scale, it's much lower. And I do see the metaformate lines, but they are like very faint. So this is why I'm still able to get, I guess, some kind of estimate. And also this image is just kind of like interpolated mm -hmm. as well, the colors. So basically here you see like all, there are some values that should be at zero right. here in the in the center, but because it's interpolated, so I'm still kind of like playing around with like what is the best way to show the final figure here. Uh, but yeah, so that answers your question. There is still emission, but it's like very okay. faint. I was thinking with the yeah. whole black thing is maybe the empty disk is mm -hmm. not black. What it, is the mass of your disk? What is how much mass is in your disk that you compared? Is this around the 23 soul mass approach? Uh yes. And is do you know how much mass? That's a good is question. Is? I don't know it's on top of my head. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a hydro simulation only, yes. is it? And uh, <coughs> are you, uh, is it just numerical viscosity then regulating yes. how the gas processes through the disk? I think one could check how much yeah. mass is in the disk. And uh, typically, you, you wouldn't want to see more than you know, tens of percent of mass compared to the central star. Just, Typically, it's to, to regulate mm -hmm. um, because people do see lines from discs. Yeah, exactly. So this is why I'm, I'm saying we we will see with uh, like a longer wavelength whether we can recover this emission because in observations we do have emission in the disc, so we should be able CH3CN to CH three CN is typically yeah, used. I was just talking about so CH three CN, for example. Um, is it? A disc tracer or a yeah. mass protostars. Do you guys have images of? Uh, I'm trying to avoid this molecule just because the chemistry of this molecule is a bit more complicated because there's more contribution from the gas phase processes. And since our model is evolving like very fast here, it looks like we don't have time to do this gas phase reaction. So I'm not very confident currently on the, the predictions for CH3CN. This is something I may need to discuss with Rob. But uh, yeah, that's why I'm trying to avoid this molecule. So I have done some simulations, but I'm, I'm just not showing the images ah. at the moment because I'm not pretty, yeah, I'm not very confident in the in the results we get. Mm -hmm. Great, are there any questions online? Um, or? Yeah. Check me online first, but I don't see, so do raise your hands online. Okay, please. Uh, okay, so I have one question. Uh, so when you're talking about the population distribution, so are you just considering the data from the variance 3D or like after the, like you are doing the synthetic emission maps after that? Um, uh, not sure what you mean. You're talking about this when I do this and then- Yeah, yeah, yeah. The analysis for the population distribution. Yeah. So you are taking it, uh, like, are you doing it from the variance of 3D or like going a step after the variance of 3D data? That's once I get the output synthetic data from variance of 3D, then I extract the spectra towards each position and I do one population diagram for each pixel based on this data. Um. So basically, you're saying that you're just, I mean, doing the variance of 3D, the post processing. Yeah. And then, like saving the files as like yes. some kind of a fits file, and then yeah, that's a the bits cube, and I oh. can extract the maps or just the, the spectra. Um, and uh, another question I had: so while doing the variance 3D, you need a dust copper value, I guess. So yeah. 
So are you taking the normal one, like the silicate one? Or the... Yeah, so that's what I briefly mentioned here. If I take the normal ones that I usually use from like this awesome coffin hanging paper, these are the ones you can see in blue and green, depending on whether you have ice or not, ice mantle around the grains. And it turns out that using this ones, the opacity is so high that they, I don't see anything, even this uh, kind of like bubble of gas around it. And I had to use these images uh, produced using this the red one that is for amorphous olivine here. And this is already like more than one order of magnitude lower than uh, the usual ones. So I have been testing using different opacity profiles and this may be the problem that the disk is so dense here that it's causing this kind of issue. So we we are testing different opacity profiles. And uh, like, what about the velocity channel that you are considering? What do you mean? I mean, you are plotting it over like a velocity channel, right? Yeah. You are integrating over it. So, I mean, what are the limits? I think I mean. Yeah, well, let me follow up. What 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 is what is the kinematic profiles? So what what do they look like? Uh, how, how how broad are the lines? Uh, particularly, I, I guess here you have very high inflow velocities in the hydro. Yeah, this strongly depends on the on the species, but the lines can be more than ten kilometers per second broad. And so to kind of like answer your questions, if I understand correctly, <laughs> it depends on what I'm showing here. I'm showing maps for like a single. Uh, channel, but I can also plot integrated intensity maps and I can, so yeah, it, it depends what we are looking at. But of course, when I'm making the comparisons, I'm not just focusing on one channel, I'm just like exploring all the channels through the lines because there is some kinematic structure because the, the gas isn't falling and so rotating around the star. But you mentioned about 10 kilometers a second uh, forward half max. Or... Maybe even more than that. I know it's broader from what we see in the observations. When I overlay actually the, the observed spectrum, well, we do have, uh, I took an example where we also do have some kinematic structure in this source, but with other sources of the alma EMF sample, for instance, it doesn't match at all because the, the lines are very thin, very narrow compared to what we get here. Well, I think this is going to be a very good way to, to met, constrain infall of velocities yeah. and we've been talking about it. So uh, I mean, our, our model uh, also has Quite broad uh, lines mm -hmm. with because it's assuming free fall, but free fall may not be true. Mm -hmm. So we should definitely right. look at that in more detail. Great. Any other questions? Let me ask about the uh, the data, the observational data. You showed this weird place where there's so many uh, dust continuum sources, but only yeah. one uh, hot core, which just seems uh, very strange. Next slides. And and that's an I guess that's an outlier, of course. But are you saying in the Alma IMF analysis, there are, are there many uh, millimeter continuum sources with quite high hole uh, densities, but very little uh, very little hole emission? Um, huh. that's a good question. I know that in total there are like a thousand dust continuum objects extracted towards. The, the 15 regions, and that in comparison, the number of hot cores of hot core candidates is only about 8%. But this is without taking into account the, the high column densities. Uh, what we see is that there is a correlation between the mass of the objects and the fact that this is a, and the, let's say, the presence of complex species. So the, all the most massive objects seems to have uh, emission from complex species. And so we classified them as hot cores. Mm -hmm. but yeah, which, are one of, few... which one of these 57 is the hot fault? Hey, good point. The maps are supposed to be on the same scale. I think it's one in the in there, maybe maybe this one. And it hardly stands out, right? So yeah, exactly. It's and it's also not the most massive one. So this is typically one example. We have cores up to 10 solar masses. So that's not the region in which we have the most massive cores, but still 10 solar masses could be already like hosting a hot core. And I know that the most massive ones don't show emission from complex species at all. And that this faint one is only about two solar masses. So this is really, we don't know what's going on in this region. Right, so none of the other 56 show line emission at no. all. I mean, you must just see CO. Oh yeah, no, I mean from complex species. We do have CO or DCN or like DCO plus, but uh, and Twitch plus as well. That's 
what I have on top of my head, but for not emission from complex species, because I was first looking for metaphormate when I could not find it. Then I took like a second step and looking for other species as well, and I really could not find anything. Stacking, for instance, yeah. stacking. But uh, anyway, it's strange. Yeah. But I mean, this is not, it's, it's, you said 8%, so quite often this happens that we have millimeter cores that don't have yeah. a combination. Well, that, that would uh, have to mean they're cold. And that would have to then tell us something about the relative uh, time scales. Spaces. I think what they're doing at the moment, so the the the, the MIMF paper I worked on was really like to build this catalog of hot cores and characterize them, like deriving the as I showed the mass and the and the size. But it's mostly based on the analysis of metaphormate, so I'm not really going into the details of like the rest of the chemical composition. But what they're doing in a like follow up paper is looking at the other species as well, and they're trying to use uh, different species to get an estimate of the Temperature. So I was going to mention CH3CN, but of course, in, in these sources, we will not find it. So they are trying to see other traces that we could use to make estimates of the temperatures for all these calls. So let's see what comes out of this analysis. Okay. Yes, I please. Just, I just have a small question. Uh, maybe I missed the point. So uh, here, when we are, do, we are doing the modeling and simulations, we were just considering the gas phase chemistry, right? Not any ice phase. Uh, all the results I showed in terms of the synthetic maps and spectra are for gas space species, but the models does calculate the, the ice chemistry as well. Okay, so uh, so for the ice phase and the gas phase, if you are talking about that and there's the transition, you need some factor of like dissolutions, right? But, yes. Um, so have you, what factors like you have chosen for, like for each molecule, it, there's the factor should change, right? Yes. So did you have like a benchmark or something like that? Oh, that's just like taken from previous analysis, what is incorporated over the years into the, the chemical model. Some of the things are measured in the laboratory, some are just calculated, and most of them are actually estimated based on like guess with taking a similar species and taking like similar values. Do you I have non-thermal dissolution as well, processes? Mm -hmm. Hmm, sorry. Do you have non-thermal desorption for yes, as well? Yes, we do. They are like uh, photo desorption also with cosmic rays and uh, like chemical reactive desorption. Mm -hmm. What about shocks? I've not asked it before. Not yet, but we are including it. Um, Rob and D are working on it at the moment, so we should have the new version with shocks mm -hmm. running soon in terms of like running the chemical models. So I'm kind of looking forward to see what we can do, because that's what one of the things I mentioned as part of the analyzing the LMIMF data is that some of these hot calls could actually not be hot calls and just like shocks. And so this is something I want to test with the models. Um, so when you are doing the, like the radiance of 3DS, the shocks have not been involved in now. So are you doing the Doppler catching from it? Or... Well, I don't have shocks included. So you are using the Doppler catching for, to do the maps on it? Uh, what I'm not sure what you mean. Like so, the in the radiance three D, I yeah. guess there is like you not know, to make it to the the maps as the um like the intensity maps as mm -hmm. in continuum level. You have the Doppler catching uh option. So are you just considering that one or not? As you don't have any shocks included in your model. Yeah, then I guess the answer is yes. They have the lost information. So in the physical model, you have uh, I'm trying to actually remember mine now, but the thermal model you have, you have heating from the star. Yes. And I think you, you must, you probably have shock heating when you do have shocks in the physical model. Yes. You have some, this is not isothermal, so you can probably have, uh, when, when there is a shock, it, it heats up. Uh, so maybe they, maybe you do have shocks in the sense of uh, shock heating, that raises rays of the temperature. I would have to look at I, yeah, I'm not sure, but then what kind of shocks would that be? Just like a kind of like a sudden increase in the temperature? Or? We have to know what kind of heating and cooling physics is in. Yeah. We do not have shocks. No, we don't. <laughs> that I know. Yeah, like okay, any last questions then? Okay, if not, let's thank Elise again.